Um, hi, hi, folks. Good afternoon. Um, big welcome to the Berkman Luncheon Series. I'm Rob Farris. I'm the research director here at the Berkman Center, and I have the uh, honor and privilege to announce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Brittany Seymour. Um, before I get to that, a couple housekeeping items. Uh, number one, we are being live webcast, so be careful what you say. The internet will hold it against you. Um, we have a hashtag at Berkman if you want to tweet this out. And uh, without much ado, I want to turn it over to Brittany. Brittany is a uh, professor at the dental school here. She focuses not only on oral health, but epidemiology. And fortunately for us, she is also a fellow at the Berkman Center where she's uh, helping us to understand digital communication in the area of digital health. Uh, this is a topic that is not only super fascinating, it is very, very important. As you might imagine, people's lives are literally uh, at stake. Um, this is an area of study certainly pertinent to many, if not everything we do at the Berkman Center, which is trying to understand how people know what they know, where they learn what they learn, and how that translates into behavior. Um, it applies not only to health, but to politics, economics, what have you. It's all over the place. But today we are going to talk health communication with Brittany. And uh, we're going to talk for like 20 minutes, half an hour, lots of time for questions. So start thinking about how you're going to quickly and concisely ask questions of Brittany afterwards. And uh, I don't think I've forgotten anything. Anything important that needs to be said before I turn it over to you? Um. No, I'll say them when, it, when you turn it over. All right, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, so I'm Brittany. I got interested in this topic of kind of misinformation on the internet as a healthcare provider. And you know, first with, with individual patients that would come to me with questions or concerns from things they found online, and now more from the population health perspective. And I'll talk about some case studies, um, for example, community water fluoridation, vaccinations, things that require community buy-in and often have a foundation of, of kind of community-driven information and, and research. So how this all works for improved health outcomes, ideally, or in some of the examples, um, poorer health outcomes. But before I get started, I'm a couple things. I, so I'm a, a healthcare provider and with a degree in public health. So I come from the health world, and that's that's the way that I um, see this work and the way I talk about it. And I'm also I've given this this talk or related talk to health audiences quite a lot. But my impression is that this is a more diverse audience than typically who I'm talking with. So I'd love to just hear from you quickly who you are or, or why you're here and interested. And if you're just a Berkman Lunch Series regular, that's fine. But if there are specific reasons why you're interested in this topic or here today, I'd love to hear that as well, again, so, we can, so I can kind of gauge how we might be able to cater the conversation. Anyone care to? <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm interested in what you might call the social physics aspects of this, that is, how does information propagate and what does the uh, better systems of identity and identity management, okay. what their impact would be. Awesome. I'm interested in that, too. So <laughs> let's see how we can talk more about that. Identity and information diffusion, definitely some key themes into what we want to learn more about. Yeah. Hi, I'm Saul Pandabam. I'm a local sort of activist and blogger. I worked for epidemiologists for decades early in my career, so epidemiology, yes. Great. Um, but I also wrote about, call it the Cambridge Fluoride Scare a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. Where they went through a really naive, oh my god, they're poisoning the water. Right, thing. right. That's, a, that's kind of a regular part of my life <laughs> as a dentist, that we're poisoning people, yes, which we're not. but. That message gets conveyed. In a bad way. Right. <laughs> hey, now. <laughs> OK, yeah. you think about Flint, Michigan. Right, right, which I've also blogged about. It's a, it's a really important discussion. Thanks for bringing up Flint. Um, and yeah, I'm glad to hear that you have some background in discussing fluoride. Um, yes? 
I lead a seminar series for the Local Engineering Society, the IEEE group and ACM group that addresses some of these issues. Uh, we're actually going to have a meeting next week that talks about some of the things you might be able to discover with them. And I also sometimes hang around the fringes of something called the Personal Genome Project. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. Mm. That's run mostly at uh, Harvard Medical School. Mm -hmm. You now have the Open Humans Project. Mm -hmm. And I recently spent some time looking over their consent form and all the things that could potentially go wrong yeah. when you are personal genomic information and other information because now they're also collecting a lot of environmental information uh, that can actually trace where you've been among other things. Right, right. So um, one of the things that's been pointed out is that with the last four digits of your social security number, your birth date and your zip code, you've essentially given away who you are. Right. This is something that you're asked for all the time on the phone when you're talking to financial yeah. institutions. So a non-linear is that you found the prevalence of hackers getting access to information. The main reason why you're anonymous currently is probably because most people don't care, or no one cares enough yeah. to put the effort into tracing you down. So how are we going to deal with all this in the future as we yeah, yeah, and, and these kinds of technologies and um, kind of open access data sets in health and how we can optimize those, right, for improved health because it's more data is more knowledge while still protecting individuals, that's a big ball in the air right now. So. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, okay, good, that's helpful. Anyone else? And I, I hope as we continue the discussion, you feel comfortable introducing yourself and talking about why this topic interests you. Um, so I've had the, the pleasure of, of joining Berkman as a fellow this year, and my learning curve in this area has been very steep. Again, from my background and my training as a healthcare professional, um, we value science, we're taught from a science-based perspective, and to us, that is the truth. That is our ultimate truth, and those who develop and create the knowledge through the scientific process are the authorities and the experts. But when it comes to the internet, I'm quickly learning that that definitely is not the case, and maybe it shouldn't necessarily be the case. So, so given that, what does that mean for health communication, knowledge dissemination, and information sharing, when ultimately we still need to rely on solid science for the best health outcomes? And that's kind of the big question that we're, we're interested in when it comes to utilizing the internet and its capabilities to communicate. So I'm gonna talk about, I kind of introduced briefly why I do the research. I think it matters a lot. I think it matters more than we even fully realize in the health profession. Um, and, and we need to kind of do some catch up when it comes to the field of health communication and how we use new media and technologies. I'll talk about, or I'll introduce three case studies that we've completed looking at um, kind of network science and internet research. And then the so what and the now what. So why does this really matter and now what can we do moving forward? And that's the part that I hope can be really discussion based because we don't have definitive answers why this matters yet. There's still a lot still to, that we need to discover and a lot of unanswered questions. And the now what is definitely an open-ended discussion. Where can we go with this? Where should we go with this? Okay, pop quiz. Does anybody know, and some of you who might know this already um, from hearing me talk, but does anybody know the most common disease in the world? Malaria, it, it used to be up there. We've made some improvements, but still common, not the most common. <laughs> That's a philosophical discussion that we should have maybe over a meal. <laughs> Any other guesses? That is one of the leading killers still, but not quite as prevalent as the one I'm about to tell you. Anyone who's heard me talk know? Cavities, cavities. Dental caries, as it's called, the most prevalent disease in the world in both children and adults, and we just found this out in 2010 when the Global Burden of Disease study was completed. Cavities. Now the thing about dental cavities, they're highly preventable and we know how to prevent them. Um, 
one of the, the best modes of prevention here in the United States, well, and globally, are access to fluorides. And in the US, um, we, we practice fluoridation of drinking water. And that was named as one of the most prominent public health interventions in the 20th century because of how cost effective and efficient and successful fluoridation has been. But despite that, um, we, we have a lot of challenges in water fluoridation. Right here in our local communities, we still continue to have communities um, contest if they want to continue fluoridating their water or not. And so the science becomes central to the discussion. Is fluoride safe? Is it dangerous? Um, does anyone recognize this study? Yes, okay, can, do you wanna? <laughs> probably the most cited, you know, it normally in the headline, Harvard finds fluoride toxic or something that you can find on any anti-fluoride website or Twitter, you know, that's. Right, right, so, so it's kind of nicknamed the Harvard study. One of the lead researchers um, is affiliated with the School of Public Health and did a meta-analysis basically looking at studies done primarily in China and some other countries uh, where fluoride, fluoride levels in water are at naturally very high levels that aren't found here in the United States. And their conclusion was that fluoride at those levels in water may have some neurotoxic effects in the developing brains of children, or they may impact IQ. The studies have been um, criticized pretty extensively within the dental public health and public health communities for being very flawed, um, and yet we still see their findings brought to the communities and applied to community water fluoridation when in fact there's no link at all. And the fluoride levels that were researched in this study don't even exist here in the US in our public water supplies. Um, and yet we see right after that study was published, um, that evening, that very day when it was released online, the media headlines were putting the next generation of brains in danger. I mean, that's catchy and scary, right? Um, and that, that, that propagates very quickly back to somebody's discussion about how information spreads. These kinds of headlines very quickly within 24, 48 hours really created a platform for this study that still exists today. So these, these uh, four news sources published that headline or similar, and I just kind of tracked their metrics online over the weekend. How many Facebook shares, how many tweets are they getting with these headlines? And it was you know thousands and thousands by the end of the weekend. And two years later, we're still working with, with um, the misinformation that has resulted from these studies at the community levels. My hometown in Durango, Colorado, just voted to, to put fluoridation up um, to see if they want to discontinue fluoridation in southwest Colorado now. And this study is brought to the table every time. So what does this mean when, when this study has really been kind of misused at the, at the local level and it's impacting health? Um, so we, did, we decided to kind of do an exploratory project with a couple students, very savvy students. Mind you, I'm from health. I don't have computer science training or any kind of background. So it was a, you know, a couple interns, and we just spent a summer looking, what does the internet look like when it comes to fluoridation and that study? Do you have a question? Yeah. Now, uh, on that issue, yeah. how many Really good question. There are thousands of studies that have been done. There's a database of about three to 4,000 studies. And as we know, we don't go off of one single study or even a handful of strong studies. We really look at the body of evidence and the scientific consensus and expert opinion. And all of that has been done numerous times. And the conclusion is always the same. It's safe and effective. And the only harmful side effect that has been demonstrated is um, speckling of the teeth in above recommended levels. Yeah. Has that same journal published any follow-up? The journal published responses. It's the same journal that's more effective than if it was somewhere else. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. So, of course, as you can imagine, after that study came out, there was a lot of um, negative feedback from the dental public health and public health communities, and they did publish a couple responses from experts on, de on water fluoridation. But those don't make the headlines the same way a scary... But they're easy to cite if you get into a discussion. Absolutely, right, yes. 
yeah. Yeah. What is the specific motivation for even printing something? I mean, it's so volatile, so controversial. I know. Um, I, mean, I think that's it part of it. I think it is. It is a volatile topic. I mm -hmm. think. Um, the researchers come from a background of environmental toxins. They, they kind of broke ground about lead and really paved the way where we initially thought lead years and years ago was safer than it's been found to be. And so that's their background. That is their, their motivation, which I understand. Um, I think lead and fluoride are, are very different and can't really be placed in the same bucket. Um, but that's part, in part why, yeah. Um, so anyway, what we did, these, we, we went to Facebook just to see how people are talking about this study and why it keeps coming up and, and is it part, you know, because of the way it's discussed on the internet. And these are three just kind of randomly selected Facebook groups who came together around fluoridation um, to protest it or, or because they don't want fluoride in their city or their country. And we wanted to see what does that dynamic look like. Um, and so we used the study as a, we just searched who was talking about the study and found about 17 Facebook groups. We mapped out three of them just to see, and we can see that um, one of these is based in the US, another is based in Ireland, but you can still see how connected they are. They have linkages and friendships with one another over this common issue of, of no fluoride in my water, and that comes back to identity. Um, it seems that, there, that, that the identity around no fluoride really forms strong relationships and bonds with these groups. And so um, you're familiar with the term six degrees of separation um, in, in, in the real world and the experiment that led us all to kind of the theory that we're all separated only by five or six other people. Facebook a few years ago found that it's separated by four degrees, and we ran that same um, algorithm on our anti-fluoride groups, and they're separated by only two degrees. So back to identity and kind of um, these social connections that occur around that identity, very strongly held beliefs within these communities, which of course, when you have these norms and values and you introduce scientific, scientific evidence-based information that kind of counteracts those norms, it's going to be rejected because it's a violation of a social norm for these groups. So what does that mean? Is there hope? Is there anything we can do? Um, we also looked at you know, where this article lives. So it's published in one place that's the scientific abstract aggregator where the, where the actual article lives. But actually where it's being discussed and talked about is, is in all kinds of places, as you might imagine, um, on Facebook, within Facebook groups, in the media. Um, most of it is in blogs. And we found that um, over 10% of the time within a any given conversation on the internet about this article, we couldn't actually find a link to the article itself. So then the messengers, the people talking about this article become really key influencers in how the narrative moves, right? Their sentiment and how they discuss this information is the only way that people get the information when they can't find the original article. So what does that mean? And, and who's discussing it? Does that become extremely important? And we think yes. Um, I'll briefly take you through another case study. I think this one's going to feel a little more familiar just because of the amount of popular press it's received. Childhood vaccinations, of course, a really um, heated topic for a lot of communities around the world, um, and in particular, specific communities in the US. Vaccines was named um, the number one public health achievement in the 20th century by the CDC. You'll see in the last um, couple of decades, we saw the largest gain in life expectancy in our world's history combined. And a lot of that is due primarily to vaccines and water sanitation, improved water sanitation practices. So vaccines have been literally life-changing for people living around the world. And yet, in, this, is, this is a map of the vaccination rates for the 2013-2014 school year of the US. Any states that are shades of red are below optimal protective herd immunity or community protective um, vaccination rates, meaning children in those communities and unvaccinated community members are at risk of coming down with the disease if they're exposed. Um, and so this was, this kind of started to set off alarm bells as communities started electively not vaccinating their children. And then sure enough, 
not surprisingly, but really tragically, we saw the largest measles outbreak happen in 2014 that we've seen in the US in almost a generation. And a lot of that centered around the Disneyland um, outbreak, uh, which you notice California's red. So again, none of this is surprising, but it's definitely disturbing. And here we go again, same thing. Does anybody recognize this study? Yes? <laughs> The famous British guy, right? <laughs> Andrew Wakefield, right? Um, this, is, this is the study that kind of created this now almost cultural phenomenon that, that the MMR, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine causes autism. Now, within the science community, that has been debunked and debunked and debunked over and over and over. But this perpetually lives on the internet and continues to be an issue. Does anyone know what happened with the Tribeca Film Festival last month? Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro. What, what happened? They had this you know, anti-vaccination film called Vaxxed, and it was entered into the film festival. It was going to be shown, and there was a lot of pressure put on Robert De Niro, who I guess was in charge of the festival, to withdraw it. He did, but like really grudgingly, and I don't think yeah. he really, you know, he, so he resented what happened. He, he, he has wasn't a, really a child, right? An what? autistic child, yeah. Robert De Niro does, and feels that every angle should be explored, right? Fair enough. Um, do we know who produced that, that movie? This guy, right, right. So some conflict of interest going on, and with enough media and community pressure, they withdrew the film because they felt it was gonna perpetuate misinformation in harmful and dangerous ways. But again, um, controversial, truly. Uh, when you think about freedom of speech and all that, read about it. It's really interesting, the process and how the film festival ultimately decided um, to make the decision not to show the film. But anyway, this study has also been retracted. Um, the author has lost his license. Um, so I think this is a big deal to retract a study like this. It's a big deal to withdraw somebody's license to practice medicine. A loud and clear message, and yet we still see it coming up. Um, does anyone know who that is? Jenny McCarthy. Why am I showing her? <laughs> Jenny McCarthy, right, a parent of, a, of an autistic child who kind of, she became... Right, so someone just said the celebrity spokesperson for the modern anti-vaccination movement, almost, although she would say that's not true. Um, but nonetheless, she kind of rehashed some of these issues, and we kind of thought that the internet made it more possible for this to get um, more traffic than it had in, because the, the original study came out in the late 90s, kind of pre-social media, pre-Web 2.0. Um, and they were able to kind of calm those fires. But then Jenny McCarthy managed to drum up a, quite a following and a lot of concerns. Um, so this is a, a Google trend, nothing fancy here, but what we found interesting is that anytime she had a public appearance, she wrote a book, she was on Oprah, she was on Larry King, anytime she had a public appearance, people were going to the internet and Googling her and Googling vaccines Googling autism. And that's a pretty tight correlation to deny that she is not somewhat influential in this. And this is back to authority. Who's the authority when it comes to this kind of discussion if vaccines are safe? And, and how does she manage to influence people and actually impact their behaviors where they go to the internet looking for this information? And what we've seen happen is Initially, she was kind of pegged as anti-vaccine. She came back with the phrasing, no, it's just too many too soon. Do you remember when that, too many vaccines at too young of an age? Or green our vaccines, take the toxins out, make them cleaner and greener. What that ended up doing is, look at the explosion of concerns now that the CDC directly addresses on their website. Um, so it just, it's propagated by these kind of social influencers. And now we have quite a landscape of vaccine blogs and alternative information sources beyond what in health we would consider the traditional kind of gatekeepers of the science and the truth. So what does that mean for health outcomes? I think the measles outbreak is a, is a, a, a pretty um, dramatic side effect of what is possible. And so what we want to do in health is, how, is it possible to combat this? When we map out the people that are publishing and sharing information about vaccines, what do these networks actually look like? 
And if we color code them, it might be a little difficult to see the colors. But with this vaccine network, we mapped out about six months um, over 2014, 2015, including when the Disney outbreak happened. So really rich media publishings um, about that issue. We have down here the mainstream media community. And they're clustered together because they link to each other a lot. Here, this small red community with the giant CDC node is the health and science community. Health and science community relies heavily on the CDC and itself. Then up at the top, we have these two communities. One is the kind of the vaccine hesitant or anti-vax group. And then right next door is the pro-vax group, which was interesting to me that there's a pro-vax group that identifies differently than the health and science community. But actually, the function of that group is they're directly combating whatever is being put out by the anti-vax group. So look at this blog. Here's why it's bad. And um, here's, here's a blog that you should be reading instead. So really interesting dynamics. And if we think about it, the health and science community, we live in this very small, you know, kind of self-connected world. And we're not efficiently getting our information and messages out to the rest of the information landscape. Um, so, so what do we? What can we do? Um, I'm going to skip a little bit ahead and just talk about. <laughs> we saw similar findings with Ebola. We did a case study on Ebola, and you can see we saw color-coded communities, and a lot of the information that was shared was was driven by fear and by social media. And some of the policies and recommendations that were implemented in the US during that time were violations of the international trade agreements. Um, so although we can't say causally what's happening on the internet impacts real life, I think there's enough that we can infer the, that, that these conversations influence people's behaviors and decisions and their health. And that's why we do this work, because that's what matters. That's what Rob was saying. People's lives are at stake. We need to get this information out to, in the right hands so people can feel empowered to make the best health decisions for themselves and for their families. So preliminary patterns that we're seeing, and I'm about to wrap up so we can talk more about this. And this is really what's still rich for discussion, is how do we make meaning of this? How do we make impactful changes? Can we? And if we can't, does that mean we need to rely on stricter policies? It may be both. But um, online information in and of itself is we're doing a pretty good job in health. The CDC's website is a, is a popular source. The WHO's website was, was prominently linked to and featured during the Ebola outbreak. So when it comes to just putting out information on the web, we're doing a good job in health. It's getting linked to. But the social use of that information, what people are actually sharing, how they're talking about it, um, the message is getting mistranslated, retranslated, lost in the conversation. So when it comes to social use of the information that we're putting out there, we're not doing such a great job. There's a, there's a disconnect between what they're directly linking to when they go to the internet and what's being shared across networks and between um, social media groups. Yeah. Is there any way of judging whether this is better or worse than a pre-internet era? I would, my instinct is that it's different. Yeah. That, um, but it's uh, certainly communities had their own views on things, uh, which might be quite different than other communities. And we've been doing that forever. Yeah, I, that's such a that's a really important good question was so is this better or worse than before the internet? Yeah, so um Vice did a piece this week on Pakistan and, and um, immunization of babies for polio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and they're, they're having big problems. And this is not because of the internet, this is because somehow the story is that these vaccines cause infertility, right? That that's really, it's really a plot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a kind of conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. So this question of how information, how information kind of um, spreads around in a community, and you know, this is one way, but the question was, you know, do you get the same thing when you don't have the internet? Is it better or worse? I mean, there's certainly a lot of old wives' tales that mm -hmm. were around um, that impacted people's behavior before the internet. 
So um, the other piece that I saw this week was John Oliver. <laughs> yes, I saw that you, too. <laughs> you saw that, yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the way media presents science result, results and findings, it just sucks. It's really bad. And, you know, you have to have equivalence, right? Mm -hmm. You have an expert says it's so, you have to have somebody who says it's not so. Right. And so, you know, this whole thing about how do we deal with evidence versus lack of evidence, mm -hmm. that yeah. to me is like, you know, one of the big cores of the, the problem. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Great examples. Yeah. Do you want to talk about pre-internet? Uh, do you want to talk about pre-internet? I, I I remember being a kid in, in Memphis, Tennessee in the early 60s, and fluoridation was a big controversy. I actually don't remember how they ended up decide, what they ended up deciding on, but you would see ads in the newspapers uh, you know, from anti-fluoridation groups. Now, back then, anti-fluoridation groups were sort of considered to be part of the right-wing fringe. They belonged you know, to the John Birch Society and you know, people like that. It, so it's a little strange to, you know, decades later to be seeing it coming from the other side of the political spectrum, mm -hmm. you know, in places like Vermont or Oregon, where I would expect people to be enlightened. <laughs> no comment, but I hear you. <laughs> I mean, which is very interesting because I mean that's one of the things I sort of the th one of the threads I chased when I was writing about this in Cambridge because it just sort of stunned me to um, you know that that it had any traction here, and I mean what I mean you um, if you you know. The thread that links them is sort of the anti-corporate movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's mm -hmm. at the, at the, um, you know, the right-wing conspiracy were, you know, the communists who were also the bankers who were controlling the world. Sure. Um, here, where you find it coming out of the left wing, you know, that I found an Amy Goodman piece where she, you know, credulously was interviewing somebody who's, this is toxic waste that the corporations are dumping, yep. you know, on America. It's uh, not, by the way. What, right, but that, right. Right, but that gets... I mean, and it, it, it's an insane thing, yeah. you know, to think. I mean, what, I mean, what does that evoke? That people are sneaking into, you know, um, water reservoirs and dumping, you know, backing up trucks with, you know, with, with, with barrels of toxic waste. I mean, it, it's a meaningless statement. Um, but that's exactly... You know, that, that's the thread there, and it's fascinating how it's gone. Right. Right. Well, and so this is kind of back to identity, right? Um, and so when we first started talking about this issue, and I presented our findings about fluoridation, and there are city council meetings happening left and right, and how can we get better information? Um, David Weinberger, who some of you may know, another esteemed colleague of the Berkman Center, pulled me aside you know, new at this, I still consider myself new, he says, Brittany, this is not a problem of information. This is a network challenge. This is about social networks and social identity. And the information is secondary to that. And, I, and that, that changed everything for me because we can, we can pound these groups with the right information all we want, but if it doesn't fit within their identity, their network, and we're seeing that, right? When we map out these information environments, we're not going to get through to them. So, what does that mean? Yeah. No, no question about that. Uh, I, I don't know much about the network stuff, so I'm wondering, like, what do what do those networks look like for uh, different kinds of stories, right? Like either uh, good science or you know whatever happens to be causing or curing cancer this week, right? I mean, what's the comparison? Is it a similar network? Is there a healthy network? Do you want to comment on that, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> Only because you're more of a network expert, I would say, between so, the two of us. That is, a, that is a wonderful question. And mm -hmm. there's no such thing as a normal network. I mean, what, would a normal network be everyone agrees and there's consensus and there's just one big clump of truth? I mean, the world doesn't work that way. And, and the question is, is there a flow of information and is there some kind of debate going on? And the best we can tell is that there's a little bit of flow of information uh, on different topics, but that the level of discourse and dialogue is probably not what we would hope it to be in an ideal world. The notion that people who know the truth are convincing the people who were mistaken what the real truth is, 
Uh, hard to see evidence of that right now. Thanks. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, point out uh, there is a network of enlightenment which I think has been is centered at the Berkman Center. Uh, um, <laughs> the um, there is work that's kind of related to this about the effectiveness of meetings, mm. mm -hmm. um, and which I know is going on, and, and that seems it's not exactly the same thing, and one has to also consider, for instance, on identity, maybe the right to be ignorant, uh, that is, the right to have views that are different than those of some at least in somebody's mind, dominant um, culture. Um, but uh, the, that's the, so, the social physics aspect of the thing. Um, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they've got some measures, and apparently measures that are, are of sufficient interest that there's spending by business uh, on, uh, behind uh, the measurement of effectiveness of meetings. Mm -hmm. What does a conversation look like in an effective meeting? Yeah. So I, can I elaborate a little on that term measurement? I think this is what, why this, re this research excites me so much, is because we now have tools that allow us to map and measure these information networks. And we still have a lot more we, we need to learn about them, but the fact that we can measure them means data. And data means we can design interventions and test them in ways that weren't possible before. Um, so to me, that's really where the possibility lies with this work, is testable, measurable interventions that may or may not work. And if they don't work, we need to know that. If we're pumping all these resources into improving our digital communication campaigns when ultimately it's probably not going to make substantial changes, we need to know that. And then we need to have conversations with policymakers, and I mean, that's a, just a different approach, right? But if it's possible to improve our communication approaches and reach new audiences with our own messages and information, to me, this research is gonna get us one step closer to actually being able to do that and track it and measure it. Uh, in the back there, yeah. Uh, I had a question, but now I have a prequel kind of question before that. Um, so uh, I heard you say network, their networks and identity. So could you first clearly um, kind of define what we're talking about when we say networks here? Could, is it anything more than the, the webs, like the underlying webs of connection and interactions between people and kind of the pathways of information? Yes. Is, is, so... Okay, that's what you mean by network. Okay, uh, so my question is, uh, as a part of the, the project that you alluded to, have you also t actually talked to these, uh, to the, not the spokespeople, but the, but the regular people, the common people who are part of those groups? Um, because I think, because I have, and uh, as a part of the sociology course, and I think <laughs> it's not just the problem of not effectively disseminating information. It's not like they think that vaccine causes autism because they haven't heard that the scientific consensus says otherwise. It's not always the case. It's almost always not the case. Right. They have heard it, and the, the centerpiece here is their perception of science and scientists. Because uh, if you actually talk to them, they will cite examples, historical examples, of scientific consensus used to real consensus, not just local consensus. Real, like, kind of universal, kind of global-esque scientific consensus used to justify things like racism. Mm. It's not even that far back in history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was really consensus. And they would say, okay, now you have consensus. I don't oh, really I see what care. You mean. Right. So the, the perception they have of science, mm -hmm. that's something more profound that, yeah, that's the main question. What are we going to do with that? Mm -hmm. And what are the ways of, ch oh, yeah. Well, and I think, first, your comment 
emphasizes an underlying theme and theory that we're working on, right, that it's really not a problem of information. And we seem to be finding that. But also back to your comment about um, John Oliver's piece where he talks about how the media makes science look. One day it's this study, and the next it's a different study that says exactly the opposite. And it makes us sometimes look like we don't know what we're doing at all, <laughs> right? Um, whereas for us, it, that's the process. That's science. We always are collecting more data, looking to improve and better ourselves. But then depending on how that's presented, it can look like we may not know what we're doing. And sometimes we don't, and we admit that. And the discourse at a scientific conference about our limitations is very different than the discourse on the broader internet, right, about those limitations of science. So, so I, I don't know. I may bring the wrath of the techies down upon myself. <laughs> um, I, find, I find your talk, it's, it's very informative, informed and informative, but I find you tendentially a little protecting the scientific and medical community. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm a skeptical person, and I enshrine the precautionary principle. Um, my younger son got all his dental care at uh, Children's, by the way, and um, I allowed them to paint his teeth with fluoride. Mm -hmm. I must confess that I do filter my Cambridge tap water to get rid of uh, fluoride as well as other nasty things in it, uh, or things I consider suspect. Um, so in the case of, uh, I just wondered what, you, what your position on uh, uh, mercury amalgam is, because it was used at that time routinely, just a couple of few years ago, yeah. routinely at children's. And I had to tell them, not just one time, but every time, not to put mercury amalgam in my kid's mouth. And of course, I think they were putting bis bisphenol in A in it, and I only discovered that until later. So sometimes the solutions or the alternatives are not clear. But So what's your position on mercury amalgam? That it's safe. Um, the, the, there's been a global pact to reduce the use of mercury worldwide for envi environmental reasons, and that definitely impacts the dental profession. But as far as use um, in the dental offices and the way it's used, um, the science says it's safe. But you know, your, your concern is common. And I was, by default, because of the choices from my patients, a mercury-free practice, although I was fully equipped to do um, dental amalgam, the mercury filling. Um, nobody wanted them. And one, they're not as pretty. They're silver, and we have prettier materials, and that's also the direction we're going. But I never felt like I was um, putting my patients at harm by, by using those materials. But I think it's, it's, it's phasing out for mul multiple reasons anyway. Thanks for the question. particularly with young children in dental offices, and it seems to have increased a lot. There's a lot of literature saying, you know, you should minimize radiation exposure, and yet when my kids went in as, er as early as four, we were sort of encouraged to irradiate their faces with full dental x-rays when they just saw their baby teeth and no evident problems. Mm -hmm. I would push back on this and was treated like a vaxxer you ah, know, right. for, for questioning this. Yeah. And ultimately, I had to say, you know what? I don't want my daughter having her face irradiated if you're not telling me there's a real reason for it. And I said, give me the, where's the science that says if she has x-rays every year at age four, five, six, and seven, that later in life she'll be better off um, with her dental health? And of course, they weren't able to produce any. Similarly, when they, all, all three kids got sent, oh, you need to go to the orthodontist, and the orthodontist insisted they all needed some minor adjustment costing thousands of dollars and more radiation to expose their faces to get this treatment. I again asked, what's the evidence that doing orthodonture for these apparent minor adjustments mm -hmm. will produce a better outcome later in life? And again, the line went dead. So maybe I'm a vaxxer but, <laughs> yeah. um, in, in this case. But I said no to some of these things. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see evidence coming back. I guess all I'm saying is there's a flip side to this, that maybe there's a, a reason to have uh, people questioning and uh, sharing, and yes, the vaxxer and the fluoridation is pseudoscientific and yep. unhelpful, but maybe there's other ones. I would guess I'd long-windedly like to just see what your view is on the, the radiation question. Um, sure, I, I love that people are taking advantage of having a dentist in the room. <laughs> I'm happy to play that role, too. Um, <laughs> It is a, that's heavily determined by insurance companies, dun, 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 but um, 
dental t uh, ra radiology in, dental in the dental world has come a long way. Um, you know, I'm not sure how old your children are or were when they were getting, but today, today, today's kind of standard of care for children is um, a full series every year or two to see how the teeth are developing and growing, and then a few kind of updated ones at, at their six-month checkups to make sure they don't have cavities. Cavities move quickly in kids' teeth. They can come back and have a bombed out tooth in a very short amount of time, so we're proactive with kids. Um, but today, the technology, the, the radiology, you can get the same amount of exposure walking in the sun from your car to the practice that you that then you'll get at with the full series of X-rays. Um, it's very very low exposure. Digital. It's digital, right? The te yeah. Um, but we're seeing the same thing with CT scans and how regularly they're used for diagnostics, right? And that they may not be as diagnostic as we'd hoped. And are we? Um, exposing people unnecessarily to radiation. So it is a topic, and digital x-rays, that's been a big focus, is reducing um, the, the, the radiation exposure. As far as ortho, um, I don't know, I mean. <laughs> yeah, well, and so that gets to the way our health systems operate, and that every office operates within its own health records. And if you want to be extremely diligent and transfer all your records yourself, you can. But there's no easy way for these systems to talk to one another, which is off topic. But another um, discussion that's worth having is, should we consider systems, health record systems that talk to one another so that you don't have to take the same x-rays twice in a month? Um, and then I just want to talk more a little bit to answer your question about kind of authority and truth. And I would, I would say um, it's been humbling, be, you know, doing this research from the health world. I was earlier on, and I won't say who, and it was not Rob, but somebody I've been working closely with said I'm judgy. And I was like, oh my, yes, I am judgy. <laughs> but that's why I try, especially with non-health audiences, it's a very different reception, as you can imagine, when I talk with health audiences than with non. I always remind people I come from the health world. That is, I have had very sick children in my hands because of the lack of these interventions. That's my lens. That's where I come from. I have really worked to put myself within the identities and, and, and mind frame of these, these other communities and where people are coming from. I don't think the vaccine hesitant families say, I want to be ignorant. I'm just, I've decided. That's not, you're right. They don't say, they're not like, I am going to ignore the information and remain ignorant. No one decides that. that it's much more nuanced and much more complex. So I'm, I'm somewhat limited in my approach and views on these topics because of my background and my identity as a healthcare provider, right? So identity, I think, is a big key theme in all of this. I've, I saw another hand. Yeah. Um, the, I, to, to kind of talk about the sociology of this, I mean, it's an old-fashioned idea, actually, but I, I like the category of experience, like, what lens are people looking through the ground in a very specific case? I remember a great study by Adam Ashforth, an anthropologist, of um, why people in South Africa, when AIDS started to spread in the heterosexual population, didn't trust um, the idea of using condoms and things like that. And uh, they, the, the folklore was AIDS was caused by witchcraft, that somebody would hire a witch doctor and do something to you, and then you'd get it. And his analysis, I won't go into all the details, was that if you're a, an African in South Africa and some white guy in a suit comes to you once a year, or a white guy in a white coat, and says, oh, here's all this stuff, and this is right after apartheid has fallen, yeah. um, that... Uh, Whereas this disease, and you know, the disease, it, would, it didn't happen right away, right? You know, like you'd have sex and nothing would happen for a year and a half, or you know, who even remembered. And so it all, he, his argument was basically the witchcraft theory from the ground actually made a whole lot of sense. And the, the, the trick it was finding out from what perspective this stuff that sounds nutty or uh, kind of 
like a form of denial where, you know, exactly how does it make sense? And that, and then I think the, the network stuff you're doing is fascinating with that regard, but it, that, that anthropological move, mm-hmm. I think, to kind of is still a necessary part of trying to solve the whole puzzle. I, I agree. I think what we're seeing online is nothing new when it comes to misinformation and how it's communicated and how it diffuses through networks. We've seen this in live networks for decades and centuries, right? And now <laughs> it should be no shock that it's happening in digital networks too. And we'll, yeah, we could take a couple more questions and then, okay, yeah. As long as everybody who's already gone for, who hasn't gone has already said, okay. Yeah, and grab a cookie if you want, yeah. they're still. Um, I think one, one, this is out of your field and away from the, the talk, but one reason I think there's skepticism toward what seems like authoritative information from the medical community is that there's been some like dizzying U-turns in some areas, like n- nutrition is what I'm thinking of. Like, um, yeah. apparently I should not have been drink, I should not have been eating margarine and, and skim milk all this time. I should have been eating butter and Egg full way. fat milk. <laughs> and um, this seems to be a very sudden U-turn in a rather important field of health. And when that happens, it causes a lot of confusion among the public, and you're not sure what you should be believing. Right. And then this comes back to the issue of trust and who is the authority over any given topic. Yeah. I don't even know who's right on that one. I don't think the medical team knows who's right on that yet. Yeah, nutrition's a big one. We haven't mapped that one yet for a reason. <laughs> I'm a little scared of that topic for now. Um, I'll. And then- I'll share a little bit of personal experience. Some of the epidemiologists I worked with were nutritional epidemiologists. And these flip-flops, once you're on inside the science, um, you know, are fascinating to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I remember this was in the 90s, a scientist coming to the place I worked talking about, oh my God, trans fat, we're killing people. Yeah, right. Um, and you know, it, I always sort, you know, map that, you know, to the person standing up talking about fluoride and saying, um, you know, oh, my God, fluoride, we're killing people. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, people are whistleblowers and sometimes yep. there's a truth there. I mean, yep. the same thing with, you know, would be true with Flint, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, there's this... Um, my father was a plumber in New York, um, and he got his plumbing license, plumbing contract, he got his plumbing license, you know, late in life. Um, and one of the things, the practical test was wiping a lead joint um, mm, with, right. you know, in a pipe. Not, anyway. Right, right. Um, but this was, this was the 60s, and he's saying, oh, my God, lead? Are you kidding me? Um, but, I mean, you know, societal practices don't actually necessarily map to current science and you know, the, there are lags there, um, and it's really hard, you know, when somebody's saying fluoride bad, you know, no, no, the scientists have it right this time. Um, yeah. I mean, fluoride is, is in, you know, there's so much history with it that you almost can, but, you know, the, um, doubt, skepticism. And who wants to take that gamble with their right. kids, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Did you have a comment? I was thinking that, I, I don't know, increasingly there might be some cynicism amongst the public because you have to look at uh, certainly many fields where um, where research is done, you have to say, like certainly pharmaceuticals and other places where, where where's the source? Like who has a vested interest in the outcome and so that it may sway yeah. the research findings? Are you know sort of like follow the money, yeah. You know, sure. l'argent, so to yeah. speak, mm-hmm. and that made people are becoming like, hmm, who is the benefit? You know, it's not may not may not be pure, or people are willing to sway their or put not to say put their reputations on the line, but of course they need to have their lab or whatever their institute right. to keep running, right? Right. So that may have an unfortunate effect. Yeah. Um. I think, again, another recurring theme is trust and the imperfection of science and the reminder that it's a process. And often that process takes years, if not generations. And so um, we'll go back to this slide um, as a friendly reminder, though, that 
it does work. We do see improvements in health. Um, there is a standard of care that we are, are held to, to practice. Part of that is vaccinating young children, um, applying preventive measures like fluoride to children's teeth. That is within standard of care. Um, it's, to the best of our knowledge, evidence-based medicine for optimal health outcomes, but it is imperfect. And sometimes people get sick or die because of the medical interventions that we have offered them. Um, healthcare is one of the most dangerous activities people can engage in in the US, is getting healthcare. That's sad. Um, it's as dangerous as, mount, as mountain climbing. You know, Per people engaging, you have a high number of deaths. We're not proud of that, and we are working on that. But unfortunately, it means that we will cause some harm in the process. And we do take that oath. I stood, you know, got my hood and took the oath, do no harm. And we practice that way every day. But ultimately, unintentional harm does occur. Um, we're getting better, but we're not perfect. So what does that mean in the interim? We don't want to be so paralyzed with caution that we backtrack to measles in the US again, right? So, so how, how can we operate and practice within this environment today? Is it possible to prevent the next measles outbreak? Or are we going to be you know, reactionary? Do we just manage the outbreak once it happens? And I don't know. But as someone with a you know, population health degree, I would like to think prevention is possible and that we can empower people to, to make the best decisions for themselves based on the science. Um, and maybe in five years, I'll abandon that optimism. But as of now, <laughs> that's where I stand. Thank you. Can we end on that? <laughs> Thank you.